So, good evening. Welcome to our meeting here in Valby. This is the first time we are here. We, I can tell we had a very nice uh, diplomatic seminar earlier today with a lot of uh, actually also ambassadors and a very good discussion similar to what we'll dive into tonight that is on the presentation of this new report extending the new Silk Road to West Asia and Africa a vision of an economic renaissance and of course it's very special because the main author to this report who signed Ascari, 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 Ascari. Uh, our good friend from Sweden who originally fled Iraq in 1991 and came to Norway and then very fortunate for the LaRouche movement and the Schiller Institute he ran into our people and came down to a conference in Germany and then very quickly uh, joined our organization and since that time, since 94, has become a great contributor to our international work. Uh, of course, since Hussein speaks Arabic and has an insight, very profound insight into uh, Southwest Asia, as we like to call what the British call the Middle East, uh, to that region, that has been very, very important of getting these ideas, our ideas out. And then later, Hussein moved to Sweden, became even a Swedish citizen, and led our work there. Uh, but also, uh, which I think is a very, very good thing, he then decided that uh, not only to participate a lot of making the first version of our report on the, the, the Eurasian, the new Silk Road becomes the World Land Bridge, which we have outside, uh, but also took it upon him to translate it into Arabic. Uh, and this, I think, was an extreme uh, generous gift to, to mankind to get these ideas out there. And then, of course, he's then becoming, taking the lead in making a new report on, uh, very specifically, on Southwest Asia, also Africa, uh, what are the gigantic possibilities in terms of economic development uh, uh, for that whole region. So, uh, one short thing I will mention for those that have been alert have seen that we are in very interesting times, very dangerous times, because there are clearly those circles that uh, both under the Bush administration and the Obama administration worked very much together with the British to have permanent war have not given up. Uh, Donald Trump, for whatever he, he is, uh, which is much different what the media says, he had the idea now the US should no longer have this war policy, which we th felt was very important. But as people can see, the other side doesn't give up so easy. Uh, I mean, Trump said, I want to normalize relationship with Russia, I want to get out of this bind, and what happened? was that even before he was president, you had this whole campaign launched, the so-called Russia Gate, to prove collusion between Putin and Russia and the Trump team, that somehow Putin was this evil mastermind controlling Trump. And that uh, uh, fairy tale has been used to undermine uh, Trump and says, see, uh, if you normalize relations with Russia, if you do not have a war policy for permanent war, it proves that you're a Russian agent. Now, we have been working very hard to get to the bottom of this because this has been preventing what otherwise should be that the United States could join in collaboration with China, with Russia, in a de development policy for the whole world. And therefore, it is very important that uh, the House Intelligence Committee uh, uh, just released a memorandum from the, from the chairman, Nunes, a four-page memorandum basically uh, summarizing what they have found when they questioned the FBI and people from the Justice Department about the basis for their whole Russia-gate investigation. 
Because what came out when push came to shove, when they threatened the FBI people and the Justice Department people to be thrown into jail unless they collaborated and told what they knew. It turned out they knew nothing. There never was any collusion. It was all set up by this report, this dossier from Christopher Steele, a former British MI6 agent, which formerly then became private operative, and then worked for the FBI, but not only the FBI, worked for Hillary Clinton's campaign, worked for Fusion GPS, was employed, actually got, uh, I think, $180,000, substantial amount, to dig up dirt on Donald Trump. And this dirt digging operation became a dossier on Trump's relations to Russia, something totally fabricated by Christopher Steele. And that dossier, and only that, was then used by the FBI, by Comey, to go to FISA, this, uh, foreign, this special court they have in the United States, which can give permission to the intelligence services to spy on Americans if, there's a, uh, if they can prove that these people are working as spies or agents of, for foreign powers. And they went to the, to the court, and they took Steele dossier and says, we have this report, and we are corroborating it right now. It's very, very fishy, and we have to spy on Donald Trump's campaign because this proves that he's probably working for the Russians. Despite the fact that already by the time they went to the judge to do this, they already had to fire Christopher Steele because he was going around telling journalists that I'm working with, for the FBI, so you should publish this story and you should publish that story, something you're not allowed to do as a secret operative of the FBI. So it was, and this is what the Nunes paper basically goes through, it was a fraud. There was no collusion, there was no Russian interference in the election campaign up until now, there was no Trump team involvement with that. The whole Robert Mueller thing, is a fraud, and it's coming out right now. And that is good news, because uh, that opens up the possibility for despite whatever Trump is, I mean, you know, he's not something, a rose grown in our garden for sure, but that opens up the possibility that Donald Trump, that like Emmanuel Macron, who just went to China and openly embraced this, the Silk Road policy, why is Emmanuel Macron doing that? Well, he's a populist. He wants to become a great president. He wants the whole world to know how great he is. He wants to put his mark on history. And he's bright enough to know that if you want to do that right now, then you join the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, Donald Trump want, wanting exactly the same thing. He wants to become a great president. He wants to be remembered as President Trump the great American president. Well, uh, there's a very good case to be made, uh, and we are making it for Trump and his people saying, well, if he wants that, and if he wants to build infrastructure, if he wants to make America great again, it's not going to happen by making Wall Street happy. They're just going to bankrupt everybody. That's what they do. Enrich themselves on everybody else's behalf. If he really wants to do all of that, he has to join the Belt and Road Initiative. He has to join in with the Chinese. And then if he wants to build infrastructure, well, the best way to get that done is to join uh, with China, with Japan, with those that actually knows how to build this, and not wait for the private-public partnership to somehow miraculously find out that they want to donate big infrastructure to the United States, because it's not going to happen but instead using the powers like was done under Roosevelt, like was done under Lincoln, like was done under Hamilton, the first finance minister, go out and use the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the powers invested in the US government to create the credit for these infrastructure projects and for the development of the nation. That's what the United States has done before, that's what China is, has been doing in the recent years, and that's what we hope that the United States can do again. 
and hopefully not only Macron understands this is part, should happen, but all of Europe will join into that policy. So uh, it's very exciting times. Things are in a flux. The only thing you know for sure is you should not trust what you see in the media because that's lie, that's fake news for sure. You have to think what's behind the news. And I think uh, that's our role also to really get the real story out, like we do in this report. So uh, let's hear more from the man himself, <laughs> Hussein Askari. I hope. Yeah, you're, you're on. All right, yeah. Um, thank you, and uh, thank you, Tom, for the nice words you said. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be in Copenhagen because it's really inspiring to be in this uh, atmosphere you create of optimism and uh, joy in your work. It's just very special about Copenhagen. <laughs> You do things because you, you feel joy in doing it, and it, uh, you can see it, you know, can feel it, that people here are happy to do the work, the hard work uh, that uh, you are doing. And uh, this, the purpose of this report is actually to inspire people that we can get rid of poverty all over the world. We can establish peace and prosperity for everyone, for every nation. Uh, and uh, we have Helga Tsepp Larouche, the chairwoman of the Schiller Institute, has always talked about the development of Africa as the moral imperative of the world. If we cannot develop Africa, we, would be, we are morally bankrupt. And Africa was the test for us. And then, of course, this whole situation in Southwest Asia, the so-called Middle East, I will tell you why I don't use the word Middle East, and I will be offended if you say, name the word Middle East in my um, meeting. Uh, Helga said that because Southwest Asia is a key area of the world, it's important for trade, it's important for the whole, the world is dependent on oil and uh, gas going from this region. Uh, it has an explosive potential for conflicts. It's very easy to start conflicts there, but these conflicts are part of proxy wars, interest of the big powers who are fighting uh, in that region. So Helga's idea was always that you cannot have peace without a, an, a key component, which is the economic development. And therefore, last year, I mean, we, in the beginning of the year, already in September 2015, I mean, we have the previous uh, World Land Bridge report, uh, which talked about the new paradigm, how the BRICS nations are establishing a new paradigm that the Belt and Road idea, which was announced by President Xi Jinping in September and in October uh, 2013, that Helga said this is the opening of a completely new era in, in <laughs> human history. Uh, but combined with that is the intervention by Russia and Syria in September 2015, when the Russian president, after agreement with the, um, the president of Syria, 
decided to put almost the whole Russian military arsenal into Syria to defeat the terrorist groups, but also to stop the so-called regime change policy, which the United States, Britain, the EU, and the regional proxies like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and others were supporting to destroy Syria. Uh, and that was, and I said it already then, that the world after September 2015 will not be like the world before September 2015, because Russia and President Putin, he drew the line and said, no more regime change, you will have to continue it on the basis of defeating us. And this means world war. So we advise you not to come a step forward. Here stops the whole thing. And they managed together with the Syrian army and the, um, uh, the help of Iran, even Hezbollah and uh, other forces to conquer these terrorist organizations and push them back and now a great part of Syria is now liberated from ISIS. And I was in discussions with Helga, you know, I said that it's now, this is going to happen. ISIS will be defeated. Even in the worst situations where ISIS was expanding, I said, ISIS will be defeated because the Russian intervention is going to be decisive. They will not stop before finishing the job. Uh, and it, it did happen. There was a completely new, all these other forces, they had to withdraw. Turkey was forced uh, to stop supporting many of these groups. Uh, and the, uh, the, the, the flow of financial and military means to Syria was stopped to these terrorist organizations or very bad uh, diminished. So in, in that atmosphere, it was the right time to bring this idea again of the peace through economic development, which the Palestinian Israeli process failed into achieving. You know, the reason I joined the organization is that I was in Oslo and during the Oslo process between the Israelis and Palestinians and the Schiller Institute came to, to Stockholm. They had a, a seminar and they said, Oslo. in Oslo, uh, they, they said, if you don't have economic development for the Palestinian people, Jordanian people, Lebanon, Syria, even for Israel, forget about the peace. It will never happen uh, because people will not see any uh, change in their life and the future of their kids and when you are just signing political papers with nothing happening on the ground. So that was an inspiration for me and I thought that this is now the time, especially now that we have the world's second, soon the first economic power on earth is ready to implement these ideas and they are already doing it. So this new, um, this new paradigm uh, which we talk about, uh, it completely changes not only the realities in many parts of the world, but it also completely changes the axioms of how nations deal with nations. We, our idea is, you know, like the new paradigm is based on what the Chinese call partnership, while the old paradigm is based on alliances. You build military alliances. Geopolitics' basic idea is that in order for you to control and be powerful, the powerful force, you should undermine your adversaries, undermine the, the allies of your adversaries, create new alliances to, to divide and conquer, to split nations, to create wars. And of course, for the British, the most important thing is like today, they don't want the United States to work with Russia and China. Earlier, it was preventing Germany and Russia from working together as land-based uh, uh, forces and uh, economic powers versus the maritime British Empire, seafaring empire. It's the same thing now with Trump, the, the whole campaign. They, they, even the slightest hint that he could do that freaks out the London and Wall Street uh, uh, powers. So anyway, I mean, the, the whole idea, we had this terrible paradigm, which, you know, the alliance, the special relationship between the United States and Britain after World War II has created havoc in many parts of the world, including in Iraq, at Libya, we had all kinds of uh, terrible. But now with the BRICS nations in 2014 coming together in the Fortaleza Declaration, that was also a turning point that the world is moving into a 
completely new direction. And that process is unstoppable because nations like Europe and the United States cannot stop that development, whether it's in China, in Eurasia, or many parts of Eurasia, or in Africa, because these nations are now willing, or South America, are willing to work together with Russia and China and India on their own. It's Europe and the United States who will lose by not joining, but they can create problems. But these problems, as I said, with the, the case of Syria, it means that you should have a war with Russia and China. That's World War. The only thing which can stop this new development is, is uh, a world war, which, is, which could happen. Um, so anyway, the thing is, I mean, we have a lot of focus on China's role, uh, because China is, the, as I said, the, the world power which has been ready to offer all its capabilities to develop other nations. It's knowledge, it's technology, it's even financial force to develop other regions. This never happened before, uh, at least, you know, not to this uh, level. But the other issue here was that we are dealing with axioms of understanding of economy, of human nature, and the nature of human society, which has to shift in order for this new paradigm to be sustainable. Because now we have a lot of people talking about, oh, China, they want to have a green economy. You know? But the Chinese, they think about the green economy a bit different than what we have in Europe. That for them, green economy means better technologies that does, does not pollute, <laughs> which means nuclear power and other power. Of course, they have this uh, fascination with solar power. But uh, there are many axioms in economics, uh, which has corrupted the, the view of economics in, in the West, that have to be corrected for, in order for Europe and the United States to join this new paradigm. And this is a very fascinating uh, image. I mean, if you understand economics as Lyndon LaRouche does, then you are also able to make such forecasts because economics is the possibility of a society to maintain uh, a higher living standard for the population through the understanding of new physical discoveries of new physical principles, utilizing them as technology to improve the living conditions and the productivity of society. Or as LaRouche says, increasing man's power over nature and transforming nature in a positive direction. And if you have that kind of understanding, you can look at any government or any region in the world and you can determine really by looking at where they are investing and where, what is the focus of society, the government, and the culture, then you can actually forecast where this country is going. And this is exactly what Lyndon LaRouche did. In 1995, he presented this uh, diagram, it's called the uh, typical collapse function, and he refers to this as the, the diminishing focus and investments in, in the physical economy, mainly infrastructure, new scientific breakthroughs, space technology, and so on and so forth, and the increase of financial and monetary uh, re uh, assets, which are co going into completely different directions. Now, this is, this, the collapse took place in 2008, as we have known the financial crisis, but the governments in the West are, of course, continuing to pump money into the financial markets because they think it's better to save the financial markets and banks because that's the basis of the economy, uh, rather than focusing. China did the opposite. In China, this, uh, the, the blue line is good, pointing into upwards, where the physical uh, economic investments match the growth of financial uh, resources. So, the Lyndon LaRouche and Helga and the LaRouche movement generally, this has been our vision of a, a, world, a world working together in peace. Uh, this is the, the world land bridge. Uh, it's uh, another stage beyond the, the new Silk Road. Uh, this was already presented in the early 1990s, uh, long before the Belt and Road Initiative was announced, was announced. But China already in 1996 adopted this idea of reviving the Silk Road as an economic strategy for China itself, but also working with other countries. But the development process was focused inside China. Uh, and then in 2000, 
2013, as I said, the Belt and Road Initiative was transformed from a merely Chinese project into a global phenomena, a global initiative. And of course, that was in, in a certain way a reaction to the collapse of the international, uh, both financial and physical economic. Uh, the only reason the world economy kept going after 2008 was actually China's growth continued. China stands until the last five years, China stood for 30% of all growth on the planet. 30%. Because there is no growth in Europe, there's no growth in the United States, except for financial assets. Real growth is taking place in China and nations working with China and the BRICS nations. So that's the only thing which has kept the, the world economy going. But th this all depends on shifting this whole uh, dynamic into this uh, new paradigm. Then we go back, we want to show this because this is a different perspective because we don't want to exclude the United States from this uh, initiative. Many people have this geopolitical minded sense that, okay, now finally we can exclude the United States. We can have Eurasia working together and the Middle East and so on and so forth. And then we can just forget about the United States. Now, this is not really conductive to world peace. And the United States also has the right to benefit from this uh, development, it just need to change the policy there. So this is why we present this as the world land bridge. The, as the, even the Chinese say, this is not an exclusive club. It's not for some nations and not other nations. Everybody can join, but they have to take a decision themselves. But here we go back to the map, and this is with the Africa and West Asia in focus. The reason I don't use the Middle East, as I explain in the book, is that this is a term which was invented by the British East India Company, because the notion is that their idea is, okay, Britain controls all these places, uh, we need to see where our properties are from the perspective of London. So if you look at the eastwards from London, you know, you have the Near East, you have the Middle East, and you have the Far East. And these are people working in the East India Company who coined this term. It's completely absurd doesn't make any sense because if you are in India or in China and you ask somebody at the street corner, say, what is the East for you? And they will look around and say, well, it must be the United States. That's the first land we, and uh, well, and then the middle, the middle from these, that's Hawaii, you know? <laughs> the term Middle East does not make any sense unless you are a Eurocentrist with an imperialist view of the world because you only see the world from Europe or from London. Therefore, the scientific correct view of the world is from space. You look at the planet from space, you see distinct continents. Or like we have Eurasia, it looks like one continent, but we have distinct uh, areas and regions and, which are called continents, and they have east, they have west, they have south, we have southwest, you know, and north and so on, and central Asia. Uh, so that's the, the right way. The United Nations use that terminology. The United Nations in the protocols, they, they say West Asia or Southwest Asia, you know, East Asia. They don't say the Middle East, the Far East. Or the, uh, it, it's, they use the more scientific uh, term. So I, it, this whole area is called Southwest Asia. Actually, it includes Afghanistan in the terminology of the Middle East, but Southwest Asia. So, but in our report, we are not including Central Asia and Afghanistan, we focus on this region, mostly from you know, the Arab countries and the Gulf, and then moving into, into Cairo. So that's why you know, we use the term West Asia. We don't say the Middle East. Now in, uh, in 2000, uh, 2002, LaRouche was in Abu Dhabi at the Zaid Center uh, think tank and uh, in a conference about oil and uh, gas and uh, world politics. But he, he gave a very brilliant presentation on the coming financial collapse. That was before the 2008. And he told people to take the lifeboats. <laughs> uh, but he also said that the, the countries of the Gulf, they should focus more and more on uh, both benefiting from their strategic position as the crossroads of the continents between Europe, a Asia, and Africa, but also that the, so the natural resources they have, the hydrocarbons, 
if you build new power generation capacities like nuclear power, then you can use the oil and gas instead of exporting it as raw material. You can build industries, chemical and petrochemical industries, whereby you can produce materials like plastics, chemicals, and other things which have maybe 10 times the value of raw oil. And that will have much more employment for, for people, uh, well-paid jobs, and it has a certain, through the knowledge of chemistry, it also you have to develop a lot of scientific institutions to deal with these uh, kind of industries. So burning oil and gas is very stupid. You can have other sources of power and use oil and gas as uh, as raw material for industries. M most of the things we have around us now is made of plastics and uh, you go to a hospital, it's, everything is in plastics, which is very important. It's a very important material uh, and it's also recyclable. Uh, so anyway, that was the Lindu LaRouche's advice, but this region got engulfed in the, after the invasion of Iraq, the regime change in Libya, the regime change in Syria. We had this series of wars and terrible developments, but the Chinese wanted to make a, a key intervention uh, by uh, President Xi Jinping going in January 2016 uh, to, to Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Iran, who are on the surface, they are in conflict with each other on this Shia-Sunni divide and the threat of sectarian war. And he brought this message that China is willing to work with all these countries together to extend the new Silk Road, to build infrastructure, fight desertification, uh, and build new, new, even nuclear power, and so on and so forth. As a means, this is the soft side of the Russian intervention. The Russians intervened, intervened with military force. The Chinese want to intervene with economic force to build peace. And that's why this whole now, the, all these nations are individually working with China, but they are not working together because the geopolitical grip uh, of the division created in the region is still very strong. And in, the, in 2014, uh, my colleague Ulf Sandmark uh, was in Syria, presented an idea, we, a project for the reconstruction of Syria. Uh, he and I, we worked on it together, and it's a a general outline for the reconstruction of Syria and how to finance it by establishing a national development bank or reconstruction bank. And the Syrian government gradually started to actually look eastward uh, and have established very strong relations with, the, uh, with China. Of course, Russia, they are very strong, but also with China. And they came out publicly recently saying that they support the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. Uh, I can go through the details some other time if you wish, but uh, Dr. Buthena Shaban, she's the political advisor of President uh, Bashar Assad. She spoke in our conference in Berlin last year, uh, and she's a, a, an enormous uh, intellect. And she was in China at the same time we were at the Frankfurt conference in November. She was supposed to speak in our conference, but the same day she was visiting China uh, announcing Syria's complete uh, openness to work with uh, China on the Belt and Road and the new Silk Road strategy. And uh, the Chinese, of course, they have also offered to, to work with Syria for reconstruction as soon as things are becoming stable. But already Chinese companies are active in Syria. Uh, this is the same uh, lady, Vatena Shaban, with my friend Ulf Sanmark, uh, who visited Syria again last year. Uh, and uh, had new discussions on the, our project, the uh, Project Phoenix. Uh, but I think the, the Syrians have taken the idea and uh, they are running with it themselves. So they, they, are not, like, they are not consulting with us, uh, but we are very happy that they, are, uh, they have adopted that idea and they have complete understanding with China uh, on this, the perspective of building the, the Silk Road. So that's a, a great... Uh, development because of Syria, that's why we chose Syria. You know, as we now do with this report, we, we take the worst case, the worst uh, inflicted country, and show how this country could be brought back into prosperity and peace uh, and security. So we took Syria because Syria's infrastructure was almost completely destroyed. 
uh, most people lost their houses, their, all the services almost disappeared and so on. So to build everything again from the ground might be a very good idea. But it should be built with new methods, new technologies, while keeping the same cultural uh, and traditional uh, structures, which is Dr. Talal Mualla's job. He is uh, working in the Ministry of Culture for the preservation of, the, of Syria's uh, archaeological heritage, which was partly destroyed by ISIS. His job is to, you know, to preserve and uh, work with others to rebuild that. But he's very keen on that the Syria's reconstruction should not be on a different kind of um, style than the original Syrian you know, heritage, which is fine. So anyway, moving into Africa, we have uh, Africa had fantastic ideas since the 1960s after independence. Uh, there were many African leaders who had beautiful ideas for the development uh, of Africa, ending poverty and so on and so forth. This is a, a plan from 1982 from the Lagos uh, plan of action to connect all the African nations with um, the highways. Uh, and uh, you see, it's a, it's a it's fascinating, fantastic idea. Of course, we, we don't propose to use highways to travel from Cairo to Cape Town. That's not really economical. Uh, using high-speed rail and uh, standard gauge rail and so on, that's more effective. But what we are talking about are more development corridors, not only trade. But anyway, all these ideas that the African nations had, they were... Uh, never realized because Africa continued to be dominated by what we call the geopolitical paradigm. Uh, there are regional wars, civil wars, many leaders were assassinated by Western intelligence services. And at the same time, the approach to Africa's development, what the West calls development, had nothing to do with building infrastructure or, or, or cities or uh, anything significant. And we looked in the, for the report, we looked at some of these uh, uh, to show the distinction between the old way of dealing with Africa and the new way of dealing with Africa. And we were surprised to find out that it's not China, which is the biggest investor in Africa. It's the United States and Britain, number one and number two. They are the biggest investors in Africa. But then we said, okay, let's look what, where they are investing in. Now, one thing you can, this is the, the United States, uh, the year to year investments, and this is the stock, the total amount of investments made. But since President Obama became president and the financial crisis hit, United States investments in Africa came down to zero. Um, but the United States continued to have the biggest assets in Africa. Uh, This, the, the, the line, the continued line, this is the annual amount, uh, change in the investments. And this is the total stock, it's called, of the investments, how much assets are invested totally in Africa in billions of dollars. Uh, so there you have a total collapse of the investments, but it was due to other factors like the collapse of the price of oil. You can explain here that the, uh, the U.S. Uh, total stocks of investments in Africa in, 50, in 10 years between 2004 and 2015 mostly focused on mining. So the attitude to Africa was there are raw materials, we can get them cheap. And most of the investments were made in, in, uh, in, the, in the mining sector and financial sector. The Chinese investments are very diverse. Yes, there is mining, but there is equally as much in construction, uh, manufacturing, industries, uh, and so on and so forth. This is the British, the same 10 years, British investments in Africa. And this is a breakdown of the investments where they were investing, mining, and financial services, banking. 
And this is the blue is what goes out from Africa to Britain, profits. So you see the total focus on the raw materials of Africa. Uh, these are the uh, loans uh, extended to Africa by the, uh, the World Bank, which is a, the biggest scandal. It's, they have spent more money than China and the United States in Africa. But you don't know where you see the effects of the, these massive investments in Africa. Uh, this is China steadily going up and the United States Export-Import Bank continued to be on zero. But even with that little, which is about $6 billion, 71% of these loans to African projects is to mining. Oil and gas mostly and metal, minerals. The Chinese export banks uh, loans to Africa mostly concentrated on transportation, infrastructure, of course there's mining, uh, agriculture and so on. So this shows the, the attitude towards, uh, towards Africa's development is that there was no effort, real effort, to realize the dreams of Africa. Because Africa, I mean, I hear a lot of Africans say, well, we don't need anybody. We have the resources in Africa to become rich. We have lots of resources. But unfortunately, that's not true. Because so-called natural resources are not wealth in themselves. What you need is to have a, an economic platform, which LaRouche calls economic platform of infrastructure, uh, which is transport, power, and industrial sector to utilize that. Uh, these uh, natural resources and human resources. Otherwise, they are completely useless when they are in the ground. Or you can sell them as raw material and get affected by the fluctuations in the oil and the prices of raw materials, which many nations in Africa and the Southwest Asia are suffering from now after the collapse of the price of oil and, uh, and minerals. So th the new paradigm, what China has done, is, com is completely shifting that equation in Africa with the focus on building the platform first. And uh, that, of course, drew a lot of uh, attacks on China. Uh, we have all heard, of, certainly, about uh, you know, the Chinese invading Africa. Uh, in 2008 and 2009, we had a, a severe food crisis in the world, the price of, price of food. Uh, was rising very high, there were shortages. And in the middle of that, you had in the British and American press big attacks on China, that China is now invading Africa, the poor, hungry African nations, to take their land and produce food for China. And you could see such stories, like it, this is worse than the Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. Uh, a, this is The Guardian, I took this because this is the most scandalous piece of fake news that ever existed. And also The Guardian is a respectful so-called. And what you see there is that you have the, the food rush, rising demand in China and West sparse African land grab. Land grab is the, the main term. Uh, major economic problem, so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, this is the report. But here it says a million Chinese farmers have joined the rush to Africa. One million Chinese farmers according to one estimate. One estimate is this, which is a United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization report, and they refer to it that this is the source of this claim. So I clicked on it to read the report. I said, this is terrible. One million Chinese farmers in Africa, you know, this is... So I read the whole report, and there is no million farmers. The, re the UN report doesn't say anything about Chinese farmers. So I read it again. I read it twice. It's 90 pages, very boring report. And uh, I couldn't find any. I did a search, you know, just in case I was mistaken. Chinese, Chinese, China. And the only things I could find in that report is this statement. It says that that's the United Nations report. You can read it yourself. It says, however, as yet, there are no known examples of Chinese land acquisitions in Africa in excess of 50,000 hectares, where deals have been concluded and projects implemented. China's friendship farms, which is a collaboration process, in various African countries are formally owned by a Chinese parastatal organization, but are mostly medium-scale, 
usually below 1,000 hectares. That's what the report says about China's involvement in Africa. So where these million people, million farmers came from? It's complete propaganda. Now the problem is that most people would not click on the report and read 90 pages of boring data. But people can go to their friends and neighbors and you know, when they meet at so did you know that there are a million Chinese farmers have invaded Africa? This is what people will remember, but they will not read the report. So th this is um, what we did. Then we looked at, okay, who's grabbing land in Africa? We discovered that it's European companies, mostly British and Scandinavian companies. They are taking huge land areas all over Africa. And we had one big scandal in Sweden, the company financed by CEDA, which is the foreign aid organization. What they do is they take large parts of land in water-rich areas to produce sugarcane and jatropha. These are sugar intensive. They have produced sugar to produce ethanol and biodiesel uh, for exports to Europe, uh, which is, they say, it's uh, environmentally friendly <laughs> fuel. So there's, no, there's only one example of Chinese, but the Chinese, they signed many contracts in, in the early 2000s. But when they went to Africa, the Chinese, they said, look, there is no infrastructure here. There are no irrigation systems, and the farmers have no skills. So how are we going to grow food? So many of these so-called agreements, they were never realized. The, the Ch Chinese, they packed and left because they said it doesn't make sense to grow food in Africa. It will be very, very expensive and risky. But the Europeans are doing that. And that's where the, the real scandal is. But this is how Africa has been treated. Uh, but I picked this thing uh, that's, you know, all these accusations against China and many others uh, not only false, but also they reveal a problem we have in the West. And I like to compare it to this problem of, in psychology, it's called projection. Uh, then you can read it, uh, I can read it, it says, because psychological projection is a theory in psychology in which humans defend themselves against their own unconscious impulses or qualities, both positive and negative, by denying their existence in themselves while attributing them to others. For example, a person who is habitually intolerant may constantly accuse other people of being intolerant. It incorporates blame shifting. And then it uh, says projection. Hmm? Uh, chasing. Ch uh, like scapegoating. Scapegoating, yes. yes. Yeah, scapegoating. Yeah, it's something similar. Yeah, so projection tends to come to the fore in normal people at times of personal or political crisis, <laughs> like we have now uh, in Europe. But is more commonly found in the neurotic, psychotic, uh, in the neurotic or psychotic in personalities functioning at a primitive level, as in a narcissistic uh, personality disorder or borderline personality disorder. So I think that. The way China is being treated in the Western media reflects this problem, is that we project the way we look at the world, or we have experienced the world, or Europe have treated the world, and project that on the Chinese. Say the Chinese are going to do the same thing. And we are unconsciously saying that without examining the Chinese culture, the Chinese intentions, their methods. We don't need even evidence. So a little piece of news in, the, uh, in some newspaper about some Chinese scandal in Africa gets spread over the whole place. And says, yeah, you see, I told you. They are there to take Africa's resources. And even today in the seminar, we had such an example. Uh, the ambassador came to me and he said, there are these horrible videos uh, people spread on social media, you know, what the Chinese are doing in Africa. You know, they are, how they are packaging chicken, you know, very ugly scenes. And they say these are the Chinese in Africa. Even human beings, they say, they are doing strange things to human beings and, you know, eating human beings and so on and so forth. And this spread all over the place. And she told me, of course, I don't believe this stuff, but it's 
people just send it all over, all over the place, and there is no evidence. I, I bought a book and read it while writing this report on this agricultural issue. It's called uh, Will China Feed, uh, Will Africa Feed China? It's by a, an American China and agriculture and Africa experts called Deborah Brautigam. Very good book. Uh, after these 2009 claims, she said, I know that this is not true. Uh, when did that start? So she went to uh, Tanzania, she went to Zimbabwe, to um, uh, Mozambique, and Cameroon, and Namibia, to areas where these scandals were uh, uh, reportedly taking place. And she discovered there was no such a thing. And it's a very well documented book. Uh, and she's not Chinese, she's not a Chinese agent, she's an American, she's working in the John Hopkins University. So she had no, uh, no intentions concerning that. So we're going to see more. I mean, there we have hysteria now in Sweden because the Chinese proposed to build a deep sea port in Lisa Shiel in, uh, in the West Coast. And, you know, they had articles in the media saying that the company which wants to build the, the port uh, is connected to the military which means that the Chinese will be spying on us in our trucks, in our boats, in our trains. You know, to that extent, uh, we have this hysteria against China. So uh, anyway, I uh, will try to go quickly. <laughs> I think it took more time than it. Uh, but I just wanted to explain these uh, falsehoods. Uh, and one interesting thing about this, uh, the Chinese method is that what they say is that what we did in, in, in China, we did not start where Europe started 200 years ago or 100 years ago. We started where the latest existing technologies. And being a completely poor country, we were able to build everything from the ground. And this made it very efficient, very quick, and very uh, high quality. So they are proposing the same thing uh, for Africa, that's why they see Africa not as a disaster, they see it as a great opportunity. This is also a way of the Chinese, even in language, how they see problems, they see problems as a potential uh, uh, motivation to solve problems, to discover new things. They also call it contradictions. Uh, well, this is also part of the attitude towards Africa, is that Africa, poor Africans, we have to help them. Uh, you know, uh, that's where all the World Bank money went. I showed you the World Bank has invested more money in Africa, but a lot of that money either went for corrupt politicians or so such, uh, you know, photo opportunity projects. You know, they build this thing and then they take pictures of these ladies and they say, this is what we do in Africa. Now, the irony with this picture is that these ladies, they still have to walk many kilometers with these heavy things to carry water home. A real, if you really want to help Africans, you bring the water to their house through infrastructure. But you do this and force women to walk all these distances and children, they do that job mostly, to carry heavy water tanks. And then they say, well, this is self-sustaining, cleaning technology, safe water supply. And these things cost millions and millions. These are very, very expensive projects. Or President Obama's, uh, 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 he had a project called Power Africa. Even in the statistics the, Afri the US administration gives is that the amount of power they were expecting it will this project generate in 10 years would be even less than the minimum required for any decent living standard. And even we had some, uh, I think I showed it last time we had a, a seminar here, is that an American household's refrigerator consumes in one month more than a whole family for a whole year in Africa, because there is no electricity. And Obama's solutions did not include any dramatic changes. I uh, want to show you this. Uh, Obama was in South Africa. Everybody was happy that the first time an African-American president coming to power, this will 
make Africa's dreams come true. So he, he goes to South Africa and says the following. Ultimately, if you think about all the youth that everybody's mentioned here in Africa, if everybody's raising living standards to the point where everybody's got a car, and everybody's got air conditioning, and everybody's got a big house, uh, well, the planet will boil over. Uh, you, did you get what he said? No. Yeah, Ultimately, if you think about all the youth that everybody's mentioned here in Africa, if everybody's raising living standards to the point where everybody's got a car, and everybody's got air conditioning, and everybody's got a big house, uh, well, the planet will boil over. So, yeah, you get it. He says, if you want to raise your living standards, the world will go under. If you, the youth of Africa, these are African youth leaders, if you dream about improving the living conditions of your people, then that would be a catastrophe for the world. And this is said by somebody whose new house cost $8 million. This is President Obama's uh, family's new house in, uh, in Washington, D.C. He's a neighbor with Ivanka Trump and Rex Tillerson. Um, fantastic house, very beautiful. I got this from the New York Times. I, I did not uh, invent this. You can, you can search a fantastic, beautiful house. I wish I had such a house. You can't have it. You might not be the state bathrooms they have. And yeah. stuff is... This is an incredibly beautiful house. Now, as I said this morning, it's not a crime to have a beautiful house. You know, Obama has all the right to have a nice house, you know, for him and his family. I wish I had a house like this. But to tell Africans, you are not allowed to have this. This is what is criminal. We will not allow you to have this. Yeah. So anyway, you see, then you look at the, how the Chinese are approaching Africa. And this is the same place in South Africa. This is the China-Africa uh, Economic uh, Forum. Uh, which is a new institution. Now they have summit meetings every year, uh, so it's becoming an institutionalized uh, agreement. And this is what he said, in, in contrast to what uh, Obama told the Africans. Uh, and President Xi Jinping is talking as a person who saw how China went from one of the poorest nations on earth to one of the greatest economies on earth. And he remembers it because he lived in China as a kid, where people, China was much poorer than most African countries. So he said to the African leaders, industrialization is an inevitable path to a country's economic success. Within a short span of several decades, China has accomplished what took developed countries hundreds of years to accomplish, and put in place a complete industrial system with an enormous production capacity. It is entirely possible for Africa as the world's most promising region in terms of development potential to bring into play its advantages and achieve great success. The achievement of inclusive and sustainable development in Africa hinges on industrialization, which holds the key to creating jobs, eradicating poverty, and improving people's living standards. No leader of, an, of a, a major power in the world had ever said such a thing to Africans, that you should industrialize. Because this is how we got out of poverty. So anyway, we have a number of uh, recommendations in the report uh, to African nations, to also uh, West Asian countries, the Arab countries, uh, which I will not go uh, into detail. Uh, it also inc it including how to finance infrastructure. Uh, and also what are the scientific basis also for this the new economic development. So now the, 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 the new Silk Road has already reached uh, Africa. Uh, it's not something which is in the future. It's already happening. Uh, the Chinese have built, uh, uh, they started with the Djibouti and uh, Mombasa and even Lamu. There are a number of ports being built. But in 2014, the Prime Minister of China was in, in East Africa. He was on a tour in many African countries, in Nigeria too, but in East Africa, he had a meeting with the East African uh, community leaders, 
And he said in that meeting, and many uh, agreements were signed, that China is willing to connect all the African capitals with high-speed railway, that China will take it on itself mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. And a number of uh, agreements were signed to... Uh, so the, just in two, three years, the first railway got online in Ethiopia from Djibouti to Addis Ababa. Ethiopia is a landlocked country. It has no access to world markets through the sea. And uh, a trip by trucks usually takes uh, eight days to the, to the capital. Now that trip can go in, uh, in less than 12 hours. But it will, the speed will increase. These are not high-speed railways, but these are standard gauge railways, but they are quite efficient. It's part of Ethiopia's its own the Ethiop this is not something with the Chinese told the Ethiopians. This is the Ethiopians themselves want to have this development. They want to connect all the major cities in Ethiopia with, with railways, with other transport infrastructure, and also build uh, a number of industrial zones so they can start producing industrial products. Uh, another major project was uh, accomplished last year is the uh, Mombasa, Nairobi, uh, railway uh, in Kenya and this is part of a number of development corridors uh, this is not simply trains uh, traveling to carry people and uh, goods but this is part of uh, developing these all these regions but you need the infrastructure to do it uh, also China helped build the uh, Benguela railway which is 1200 kilometers and also re, re uh, renovating or rebuilding the Tezara uh, railway in Tanzania, connecting east and west part of the southern African continent. And all these projects are being done in, uh, with the financing from uh, China, with credit. And it's uh, quite uh, fascinating also, it's completely anti-corruption because China does not lend the money to the African countries. There's no money involved. China's export bank or other banks, they will loan the money to the Chinese companies who will build the project. And the Africans who work and African entrepreneurs who work, they get paid by the Chinese company. So the government of that, of that country is not involved in the money. So therefore there is no corruption involved in that sense because there's no money, no tangible money involved in that except the money that people who are working on the projects will get. Other nations are inspired by this process, but they are working on their own, like Egypt built the new Suez Canal. They accomplished it in only one year. It was supposed to take three years. But the president, who was personally overseeing the project, he said, no, 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 we do it in one year. We will show the whole world we can do it, and we can finance it ourselves. So in one week, the Egyptian people donated $8 billion. Or invested. Invested $8 billion, sorry. They bought, uh, the government issued specific bonds or certificates with the interest rate for the people who want to invest in the project. And they, in eight days, you had $8 billion. Egypt was uh, quarreling with the IMF for many, many years to get $3 billion, and they never managed. Uh, the World Bank is not interested in this kind of stuff. So anyway, the, this is uh, a great inspiration for the Egyptian people. There are many other projects underway in Egypt, but it also includes building an industrial zone on both sides of the new Suez Canal, uh, where the Chinese are investing a lot, actually. I was uh, in, uh, in Egypt myself. I visited the site of the Suez Canal. Uh, when I completed the uh, translation of the, this uh, World Land Bridge, Uh, into Arabic, I did it myself, and uh, we, I had some friends in Egypt, and one of them is working, was working in the transport ministry. He suggested that we launch the report in Egypt, because Egypt is a key country in, in both Southwest Asia and also in Africa, and I, I happily accepted the uh, invitation, and uh, the transport ministry and the transport minister personally um, introduced the report in a press conference where TV and the newspapers uh, and uh, it got good coverage and also I was the, then taken to the Suez Canal uh, to meet with the chairman of the 
uh, of the Suez Canal Authority. He's that guy, the Emerald uh, Mahab Mamish. Uh, he also was very happy to hear my description of the impact of the new Silk Road and the maritime Silk Road on Egypt. And I also made a presentation to uh, the planning group in the Suez Canal. And then they took me on a tour on this, the new Suez Canal. And they also had a presentation uh, of the report in the Cairo library and suddenly the former prime minister of Egypt walks into the room. He had just come back from China and he was very fascinated by the, somebody in Egypt was talking about the new Silk Road because he himself wants to, wanted the Egyptian government to, uh, to join the new Silk Road. So these nations on their own are acting to, but with the inspiration of this uh, whole project. So these are some of the ideas we are floating for African nations that they should now, in earnest now that China is interested to build the uh, high-speed uh, railway network for all African countries on the same corridors uh, which were well studied when they were proposing roads. Uh, we have the Transaqua project which is uh, to save Lake Chad, refill Lake Chad and bring, because people are, are leaving that area, mass immigrating to other African countries because the Lake Chad has been shrinking to only 10% of its original size. So I had this idea by an Italian company to build a, an artificial canal to gather water, just 5% of the water of the Congo River already here in the highlands and using gravitation to lead the water to the Kari River. Uh, it will be like 100 billion cubic meters every year, which is twice as much as the Nile River carries to Egypt. Uh, and that way, uh, uh, replenish the region, but also build a, a navigable canal and build power plants on this river where they're flowing uh, downstream uh, and build new agricultural and industrial zones. And it also incorporates this corridor, transport corridor from East Africa to West Africa. Last year, the Chinese Power China Company, uh, we had been lobbying for this project for many, many years in Europe, in the United States, somewhere, everywhere in the world, but uh, it was rejected by the European Union, by the European Commission, uh, and no private interest in Europe are interested in this kind of project. So last year, fortunately, Ch Power China signed a memorandum of understanding with the Lake Chad Commission, the countries that are uh, around the Lake Chad uh, to make a feasibility study to figure out if this is uh, possible to build or not and how much it will cost. So this is the first sign that this project, uh, the government of Nigeria is uh, planning a conference later this year. Uh, the president himself is uh, personally taking responsibility for this idea now of Nigeria and hopefully we, we will have uh, one of our members also <laughs> discussing this in that conference. So this is uh, quite promising. Uh, the the Transaqua project will make this region uh, a key center for development because you'll bring abundant amounts of water, you'll bring the transport networks, you have massive mineral wealth there, you can build industries. Uh, Morocco is also independently building a high-speed railway network which we are also saying could be connected to Europe through the Gibraltar um, uh, tunnel project, which both the, China, the Spanish and the Moroccan government have an agreement to, to study it and implement it. We have the idea to connect Sicily to Tunisia, um, building a, a trans-African river navigation system uh, to, thank you, Similar to the, the Danube-Rhine uh, system, which is, has helped uh, transport across Europe uh, greatly, the same thing is possible in Africa, both along the Nile and on the, the Zambezi River, but also on the Congo River into Lake Chad and so on. Uh, the Grand Inga Dam, this is one of the mega projects we put also in the report as an example of the totally transformative project. This project will produce 40,000 megawatts, like 40 Swedish nuclear power plants <laughs> uh, from the hydropower. Uh, it would be a, a total revolution 
for providing electricity and power for tens of millions of people in one of the poorest regions of Africa. China is also interested in this project, but there's now competition with a Spanish company on who's doing, who will be doing the, um, uh, the project. But the, interestingly, last year, when the project was getting close to implementation, the World Bank pulled out its support for the feasibility study of the report. Suddenly, they didn't like the idea, but they were keeping it on the shelves for tens of years. And then when the time came for implementation, they pulled out, which shows you that the World Bank is not interested in real development in Africa. Anyway, another outrageous idea we are promoting in Africa is that Africa should go nuclear. Because even if you develop the, the hydropower, uh, you still, when you come to a higher level of economic standard, you will need even more power. And then you would have exhausted the hydropower potential, but you have to go to, into higher uh, modes of uh, power intensity with nuclear power. So anyway, these are some of the things we have put in the report as a, like, specific projects, which we think Africa should undertake as a joint um, uh, endeavor uh, of cooperation, but also taking advantage of China's willingness to do this kind of projects, and also China's uh, technical capability, which it had developed. So anyway, this brings us to our uh, final uh, graph. Uh, by 2050, uh, West Asia and Africa will add 2 billion more people to the planet. Population growth in this region will be 49% of all population growth in the world. And you will have a population whose median uh, age range is 23 years. So very, very young populations. But more than double what it is now. Now, many people think this is a disaster. It's horrible. More African babies, you know, hungry babies. No, there will not be hungry babies if we have the, the development, true development. There will be prosperous, happy babies. You know? And uh, as LaRouche always says, you know, I remember this from my early, when I joined the he has an epistemological idea about how you had this uh, simultaneity of time, that there is no past, present, and future which are disconnected like a, a film, you know, uh, following, developments following each other. It's all connected, but in a higher realm. And in a met metaphorical but also true sense, it's the future which determines the present. Because it's our dreams, our visions, will determine how we behave today. We don't understand that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's uh, what is fascinating now with the whole Belt and Road development and also the Chinese, what the Chinese are doing and thinking. And I really urge people to really try to understand um, the Chinese thinking without prejudice. You have to look at what the Chinese are discussing. And this, I read this speech by President Xi Jinping to the Communist Party. It's like 60 pages. <laughs> it was a three-hour speech. And people were joking about it in the media and the West. You know, three hours. You know, you know nobody would listen to a, a Western politician for three hours. Not even 15 minutes. <laughs> what a wonder why. Years ago, we did. Yeah. Yeah, we, we made these uh, great yeah, yeah, but the people meant what they said. <laughs> yeah, but people meant what they said. Now we, when listen to an American or European politician, we know they are lying to get votes. But we think Xi Jinping is saying the same thing to get votes. He doesn't need votes in China. He's the supreme leader. He will be like this. And the Communist Party will be the sole party in the country. So he, he's not afraid to lose his position. He is desc describing the dream of the Chinese people until 2050, which we hope it will coincide with the African dream. Uh, and it's this kind of both imagination, but also vision, but it's a vision which is based on both a moral and scientific 
ground. I think this, is, this should be a, a beautiful idea for us and a motivation for us to work even harder in the face of stupidity. Uh, I mean, working with this report, it showed me really that, you know, I, I went through the invasion of Iraq. You know, I lived, I'm from Iraq, I saw what happened to Iraq with lies about weapons of mass destruction. I saw what happened in Ukraine, what happened in Libya, in Syria. Everything is based on lies. And the other side of it is based on ignorant and uh, stupidity. People don't, you know, like the readers of The Guardian, nobody clicked on the report to find out if there are one million Chinese farmers or not. People are lazy. They believe in the media. If The Guardian said it, it must be true. If Professor so-and-so said it on TV, it must be true. I don't need to go and look in these boring things. You know, that means you are abandoning your role as a citizen. You have to check on your politicians. You have to check on the media. They don't uh, 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 mislead you into horrible things like the Iraq war, like the Libya war, like the Syria war, and so on and so on, Ukraine, that we are heading into a, a world war. So it's up to each and every one of us. I mean, I'm not the, yes, I'm an activist, but I am doing this also as a, as a citizen. I'm doing it as a father, I'm doing it as a, uh, you know, just a, a world uh, citizen, a human being. And that does not make me the so-called expert, or so people say, well, you are an expert, that is natural, you discuss these things. Now, I'm not doing this for a living, I'm doing this to satisfy my both moral, intellectual, you know, and uh, natural impulse. To do good in the world is a natural thing. It's not, uh, it's not strange. Human beings are not animals. So anyway, I think we, uh, we end uh, with this uh, interesting image and uh, hope if you have any questions or comments, please come forward. You know. extreme insight also to many other good and bad things in the world, including <laughs> the evils of the British Empire, which yeah. is something you can write a great many books about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so uh, yes, please ask away. Yes. It, it made a, a great impact on me that Obama is standing in South Africa and saying what he said. Uh, and that makes me um, go to the problem of power and, and becoming very arrogant. Uh, I think that has something to do with democracy and uh, sharing power. And uh, I think that is a very great um, problem at the going on the same line as politics because um, uh, oh, that's difficult. But, but the, ar the arrogance of power is very much often coming from a, 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 a wait, a complex of inferiority. And, and these balances are very uh, weak and uh, very open to uh, um, missing the balance. Have, have you been thinking about that on the same time as you have been thinking about the rationality of your plan and uh, uh, of the, the Silk Road project? 
I mean, there goes uh, this this uh, state of mind of the people goes with it, and if uh, life is too hard. It's a very big uh, problem, and if it is too uh, sloppy, <laughs> it's also a very uh, big problem. And if it's, it's very not just, it's also a very big problem. Have you been thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 there are some real reasons why Obama behaved like this. I mean, he immersed in the most industrial kind of idea, but also he's a narcissistic person. And in Lyndon LaRouche very early said, Obama has these signs of a narcissistic personality. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's what LaRouche said. Yeah. But, uh, oh, okay. Does he know him? If he knows him personally? Yeah. No, no. No, no, no. just looking at what he's doing. Yeah. That's a good way of knowing people. See yeah. what they do, not what they <laughs> say. <laughs> But then you have a borderline personality of, of Trump, and that's not very, uh, yeah. you know, that's so not a very good same, idea. To, uh, the same description of this bullying is the bully has the same <laughs> inferiority problem. Yeah. Compensating yes. for their insecurity yes, absolutely. by attacking, but then they blame the victim for, for what they did. Yeah. They say they asked for it. Yes. Yeah, but you see, you kill Gaddafi and destroy Libya, and they say, "Well, it's Gaddafi's fault." <laughs> you know, or Iraq. They yes. Say Saddam Hussein. Yes. Fault. Yes. That's why we went into Iraq and killed everybody and destroyed the country and then hanged Saddam Hussein. It was his fault. Yeah. <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I see that. But you see, the opposite uh, side of the the dialogue, the opposite. I mean, there are also uh, narcissists in in China. So, so we have to find some way of dialogue and power game which is not that poisonous as the one we have for the moment, I think. Yeah, this is what the uh, Claudia and Lyndon LaRouche, they call it, you know, the common aims of mankind. That we should agree on a set of principles to regulate the, our relations with each other as nations. I think we are dependent on it. Yeah, and the Chinese have also this term, they say, uh, a common future for mankind. Yeah. That this is their, their, their diplomacy, their foreign policy will be based on reaching to an agreement with every all other nations to establish a principle for a common future for all mankind. And they say very clearly, say, we are very different nations, we have very different cultures, but that's not bad. No. They, but the, what we are used to is that in Europe or the United States, that Everybody else should behave like we do, or do what, as we tell well, them. That is a very narcissistic yeah, point of yeah, view. That, that's one of the big yeah. problems which generate this conflict. Yeah. The Chinese say, no, you cannot impose your way of life upon us. We are Chinese. We are different. We have a different culture. We have a different social system. We have a different, different political but system. They also have a very, very difficult history. I mean, yeah, I go, going uh, going through the cultural uh, uh, revolution yeah. has made damages yeah. of uh, terribly. It's interesting that uh, President Xi Jinping, in his speech, uh, ask you again. You should yeah. read it. He says uh, China's the, the the upheavals and turmoil in, of you know, destroy the Chinese civilization started with the British Opium. Yeah, you know, but they're that, awful. The, yeah, so they are, they are very clear, but they also say in the, that they will not take everything from the old times from the Chinese culture because there are many souls. You had a feudal society. You yes, a, but you see, but we, uh, uh, if, if we go if we go deep enough, thank you. If you go deep enough, the 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 Chinese Taoism and the Hermetic tradition of Europe, they are very, very uh, similar. They have very much in common. Mm -hmm. But very few people know it. Yeah. I think the, uh, it was described uh, a little bit better by Helga, or you know, she referenced the work of Leibniz. You know, yeah. Uh, I think it's in the novel. The 
and in China, uh, where he says that there are commonalities, but with the Confucian. Uh, no, no, tradition. the Confucian that is different. Yeah. The Taoism. Oh, oh, that's a very long story. Okay. But it is the emotional side of the psyche, and it is the emotional side of the psyche which go uh, to hell in the narcissistic uh, character, uh, uh, personal character. And you know, I think having this implicated into this political uh, uh, way of thinking would be a richness. Well, we do. We did that in. We did that with with uh, uh, Marx and and Freud. But it went to hell, because it. Uh, yeah, that's a long story too. But uh, but I, I. I think also. I mean, one one of the things we in the Schiller Institute has been working very hard on, and that's one of the reasons why we are called the Schiller Institute. I mean, it was. We created this new institute in 1984. And she being a German, for her adjustment. Channel one. Okay, no. The reason why she chose Friedrich Schiller was in order to to correct what was becoming the worst disaster, uh, which was that uh, the image of man was deteriorating so fast, yeah. and that what we needed was to have uh, instead of accepting. I mean, if if you look back, say thirty years. Every, you know, people would discuss, you know, Africa. How can we accept people are dying of starvation in Africa? If you were young, you said, I want to be a volunteer. I want to go down to Africa and help them get water and do something for the poor people of the world. You know? uh, suddenly, not by accident, but by design from leading circles, this was changed. Oh, yeah. With the whole environmentalist movement being cooked up by the British Queen and her consort and all of this, World Wildlife Fund for Nature and so on, everything was shifted. And suddenly the big problem was no longer how to take care of the poor people of the world. It was the problem was that we human beings are bad because we go in and destroy nature. And when we are more people, we destroy even more nature. So that's the problem. We should reduce the number of people. We should reduce man's intervention into nature. And today, of course, this was shifted yet again into the climate thing, you know. Because man is polluting the world with CO2, which destroys the climate, and the world will go under, and there's only one solution, and that is man should do a lot less. But the, but the core of this is a change away from saying the human being is something positive, is a co-creator. Our job is to finish... Uh, to contribute and help with the creation. When we have great deserts like in Africa or like in China, well, we can make go in and, you, and, and take water there and spread life. 
That's our role. And human beings, well, monkeys, they don't write poetry. You know, no monkey could write a, a drama like Don Carlos. No monkey could compose Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. This is only something we human beings are doing. But I think the key word is co-creator. And I think we don't understand that. And I think we do fight. We do make a war against the poor people today. Well, we don't. See, the system does, in a certain sense. But the prop, I mean, we have a system where it's openly acknowledged, you know, that the one top 1% gets richer and richer and more and more, get everything, and everybody else is screwed. It's not us here who is getting all of that benefit. So that's a wrong system. That's the old paradigm. That is the, also the geopolitical paradigm, but it's also a paradigm where City of London and Wall Street sets their agenda, and that's wrong, and that has to change. That old paradigm is a bestial paradigm. It's a paradigm of setting man against man in order for somebody to, to control the thing, and that has to go. And instead, we, we should adopt this new human paradigm of saying we need collaboration between the different nations of the world in a win-win collaboration for the benefit of all not just for benefit of the present generations, but all of these things. What do you do when you build infrastructure? What do you do when you build schools? What do you do when you build hospitals? Is this just to take care of us today? No. This creates an even more powerful foundation for the Absolutely. coming generations. Absolutely, of course, because it makes infrastructures, it makes work, it makes co-living, it makes yeah. a, a living community. Uh, but but I, I want to, to put that Can we just see if somebody else also oh, has yeah, questions? Yeah. Because. Hello. Just a simple question um, Are there any uh, projects according uh, to, to fight the desertification, yeah, in, in, in Siberia. Yeah, we, we have uh, one of the key projects which we have been promoting has finally got of the, uh, you know, into the decision-making process. So many files in my computer is going to, going to collapse. So. What did you ask him, Thomas? How to fight this? Is there any project that, you know, uh, on, on fighting the desertification? It's called the Iraqi Green Belt. Yeah. It's one of the projects which we have been fighting for. I personally was fighting for uh, uh, both uh, from the Schiller Institute, but also being an uh, Iraqi citizen. Uh, I also approached, uh, you know, Chinese and Japanese and other institutions to help uh, the Iraqi government in that. But uh, finally, uh, one of our friends, uh, he was Iraq's uh, ambassador to the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome. He also spoke in one of our conferences. I have had contact with him ever since. He became uh, the Irrigation and Agriculture Minister of Iraq last year. And he is one of the people who has also promoted this project, and we have had long discussions. Uh, I got help from some Iraqi experts and international experts to put together a study, um, a three-page study on the Iraqi uh, green belt to protect the Iraqi cities from the spreading desert, and uh, I was told that recently that this study is one of a few papers the Iraqi 
uh, irrigation ministry has is studying. They made a team of ten experts to study this uh, project. Uh, now they are discussing with foreign, you know, with other countries, uh, international engineering companies, to make a feasibility study. So this is one day I was very happy. I mean, this is something that I've been talking about and discussing for like ten years, and now finally it's got off the table. And the, this minister, he's a very, very serious person. You can follow his work on, on Facebook. I mean, he's all over Iraq, building canals, building, cleaning the rivers, doing all kinds of uh, good things. So this is one of the uh, yeah, great developments in that sense. But I think the Chinese have now are doing tremendous work in the Chinese deserts. Yeah. They have a, a, a company which is they are making the desert green, they are producing all kinds of agricultural products in the middle of the desert in China, they are developing techniques, they are developing new types of crops that can resist both the saltiness of the, of the soil and the dry climate. So they are also offering, they are training uh, teams of engineers from Southwest Asia and North African countries, I know that in China they are getting training uh, in these technologies and these methods. I'm fighting desertification, but the ultimate solution would be to build a new water uh, administration uh, systems, water management systems, which includes dams, it includes uh, canals, it includes uh, water desalination using nuclear power, uh, all these things. Uh, so just planting trees it doesn't help. I mean, people say, well, you can plant trees. You know, people donate money to plant trees. You know, I mean, through, through aid organizations. But uh, I always ask those people, so, well, where do you get the water from to, for the trees? Trees need water. It's not enough to plant a tree. <laughs> you have to take care of the tree and bring water to the tree. So that's not included in the, this charity organization's work. We just plant trees. Right. Somebody else should take care of the water. <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, there's a lot of work being done in North Africa. And, 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 uh, Yeah, yeah, but it's also something which I've been involved in myself with this uh, French company uh, trying to promote their technology in uh, the Southwest Asia region. Uh, they use uh, space technologies, remote sensing, mm -hmm. uh, together with geological and hydrological knowledge they have to determine where you can find uh, groundwater with the fantastic precision. So it makes uh, exploration of groundwater in dry areas very, very cheap. Right. Because the biggest cost of yeah, finding is, is drilling. If you, if you, if you drill a, a well which is about 400 meters and you don't find water, that's $500,000 loss every time. Uh, so this company, they, they have, uh, uh, in, the, in the, the worst uh, situation in the Darfur crisis, which was on the Chad-Sudan border, uh, there are 250,000 refugees who needed water immediately. Uh, they're sitting there in the desert and there is no water. And this guy, he was called on uh, by, the, uh, by the US Geological Survey, uh, and he immediately set to work, and the fantastic thing is that all the data is available from NASA. You know, NASA, in the last 20 years, they have mapped every centimeter of Earth using both uh, uh, different kinds of technologies, including radar technology, which can see below the ground. But you can also use uh, other types of remote sensing. So he took all that, which was available, and went down to Darfur. And after just a short while, a few months' work, he. Uh, he managed to find uh, and you know aquifers. Now there are 1,500 wells in these in that area. Um, many refugees went back, but the people in the villages in the area they are using these uh, huge wells uh, for their survival for agriculture. He found a huge aquifer in northern Kenya in the Turkana region using the same technology. So th that's uh, that's one fascinating aspect of advanced technology 
Uh, I mean, groundwater, it exists. There are vast amounts of groundwater all over the planet, and it's not uh, discovered. 97% of all water, fresh water, is underground. Only 3% of the fresh water we have above the ground in the rivers and lakes. So imagine how much water there is uh, underground which can be utilized. Yeah. So, but that's a case where space size, you know, sending humans to the outer space suddenly helps thirsty people in Africa. You know? So that's, that's the, the beauty of the discovery and the invention. Yeah. So when we're trying to understand why it's so hard, because we see your presentation and we've, we know that the Schiller Institute and the LaRouche movement have been presenting um, solutions to many of the, of the international and regional and global problems uh, over several decades. So when we look at what, what makes it so hard to implement these different um, solutions, Often the, the problem of the British Empire, of course, comes up. But the British Empire, as has been, been indicated, is a pretty small elite. It's, uh, you know, we, we are talking about the 1% or the 1% of 1%. Um, so if they were not able to somehow control the thinking of the population, they wouldn't be powerful at all, mm -hmm. because they would simply be too few to have any influence. Uh, so then the question comes up, how does such a small group of really evil mm -hmm. uh, and, and destroyed human beings, uh, how are they able to, you know, channel this into the population? And it's funny because uh, over this, uh, today, uh, at least uh, two times, uh, explicitly the, the term democracy as a problem came up which is, of course, <laughs> unusual. Um, and also, in the beginning, in the seminar uh, at the at Vartov, you mentioned another problem which is uh, related to, to this democracy thing, namely that um, there is this idea in the Western world uh, that somehow we have to agree on everything. Um, and I just did a study on, or I'm doing a study right now on the, on the shift in the Danish educational system in the 70s. And I think it's much more far reaching than the, than the Danish system. And there was a, a, an explicit shift from uh, people from, the, well, what was the goal of the education? And before the goal was uh, that people should be competent in knowing these things whatever discipline they were studying. Uh, and the new um, goal was that they should um, be critical and they should be, uh, you know, able, they, they should be sovereign. They should be able to think for themselves. Mm -hmm. But the way that this was implemented was uh, criticized sharply uh, from a group of teachers in Denmark. And they said, well, what the new school does is not uh, promoting this idea of, of critical and sovereign thinking, they're actually promoting what was termed democracism, mm -hmm. which is that they were making the children Do you hear me? Okay, so they were making the children critical to very specific ideas. Uh, ideas like uh, any system that wouldn't be democratic, or ideas like nuclear power. Uh, so they were making, they were implementing in the, in the, in the mind of the children the criticality towards very specific ideas. So it wasn't, so they weren't making them sovereign. So do you think that that idea of uh, democracism as this concept of, uh, of deciding what everybody should think and everybody should think the same, and if they don't think like that, they're not going to be popular, 
is that the, the modern um, way that, that the British Empire, which before maybe used more force, is now controlling the way that people think? Yeah, I don't think it's a new problem. I mean, the, it's a very ancient problem that the social control and uh, behavior control. And I think Hans Christian Andersson, the, the king's new clothes, is revealing because that's how you make people, you know, control the way they think against their own natural impulses. Uh, when they know, but this is this became a science in the 20th century, you know, behavioral control, social control, and you know, like uh, what Bertrand Russell says, Slarush calls the most evil man of the 20th century, is that you know he openly says we have to, you know, train people like dogs. We have to make sure that we have tools to make kids say that snow is black. You know, in, in such, a, there's such a way so we can control these populations and control their way. The cultural warfare is the most efficient uh, way of uh, controlling people because they will be controlling themselves. So you don't need the police and, the, you know, uh, although now intelligence services are watching and listening to everyone because it's very can easily do it with with the information technology but uh, this is a way of you know how the oligarchy controls people they're controlling their belief systems so it's as old as more older than babylon it's like the priests they were using their knowledge of astronomy when they they could predict a, a solar eclipse you know, they would tell the people that the gods are angry because you are not paying more tributes to the, to the gods. You are not offering more money and gifts to the gods. The gods are angry. <laughs> and they say well, there will be a sign. And the sign is the solar eclipse. And people will be terrified. <laughs> so that, that, this is a very ancient way of controlling people. It's very economical and very easy. So how do we break with that? Well, we, we break with that by going back to the, the classical, because opposite to that oligarchical ancient, you always had this, what we call the humanist Republican thinking, which is based on the idea that humans are creative and that the humans have the tools of discovering truth beyond their senses, beyond sense perception, beyond I, I heard, I saw that you can go to the realm of, of reason to discover truth. Uh, and that's a very, very ancient tradition too. And these two forces have fought against each other throughout history. And therefore, civilization never collapses totally because we had these oligarchical empires taking over the great parts of the planet and they, then they die. They take a huge number of people with them when they collapse. But then suddenly you have new forces emerging uh, with this uh, creating a renaissance, whether it's in Athens, in, in Greece, or in China, or in the Islamic world, or in, uh, in Europe, in, in Florence. You always have that impulse of creative humanist thinking uh, existing and available for humans, and that's what kept civilization evolving and developing. So it's through returning to these classical principles of education, of educating our kids, and being capable of reasoning to discover truth, rather than reading a, a, some professor's explanation of that truth. Uh, but that's a lot of hard work. For example, what the Schiller Institute have been proposing is that kids, instead of sitting and, 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 and counting numbers, uh, adding numbers and didacting, didactic numbers, they should work on working on geometry. They should read whole uh, original works of poets, writers, uh, and other, other things, so they can get acquainted with those geniuses directly, not filtered from, through somebody's crazy understanding of what Plato is, for example, or what, what uh, Leibniz is thinking, and so on and so forth. So, but this is a huge work uh, and I think that's the destruction of the educational systems in Europe has contributed to this terrible paradigm we have, a pessimistic society, a nihilistic society, believe in egoism as the main impulse in life. 
They even get Nobel Prize in economics, people pushing these. We had two Nobel Prize in economics on the same, on behavior, human behavior, how humans, like cows, can be nudged. It's called the nudging principle into a direction of consumption and into another direction another time. The guy got, uh, the guy got a Nobel Prize in economics. So it's so degenerate our culture has become that these are the kinds of ideas people should look forward to to become successful. That we are, our impulses are exactly like animals. We are egoistic, uh, pleasure-seeking, uh, existential creatures. We live and die, and between these two uh, moments, we have to uh, enjoy, enjoy life in the sensual sense. Uh, there's no purpose for other, any other purpose for that life. Uh, not all cultures think like this, not all societies think like this, uh, and that's great. That's why we should have diversity in the world, so we don't have it. Yeah. And if you had a question? Yeah, no, I was just thinking that about this. Um, this th I think that that's uh, probably one of the greatest missions of what we call science, is simply to train people uh, to, to only accept the truth. Because a lot of this stuff that's going on with uh, social control is that people do not think scientifically, as in they will only accept the truth. And everything we do, like, like these um, um, reports we make, uh, is uh, apart from what's actually going on in Africa with the Inga Dam or, or something else, is training to only accept the truth. Because uh, when, when, you, when, you know, when you do that, you can see all these lies that are going on. And you, are, you, will, you will not be victim of of the propaganda in the media, as, as opposed to what we call axioms, as opposed to what we call some opinion. It's got nothing to do with science. It's got nothing to do with the truth. Also, I, I, one thing which is scientific training of people, you know, one thing I discovered from my own attempts to understand certain things about, uh, you know, uh, water systems, uh, water cycle, hydrology, geology, you know, agriculture. I try to understand as much as possible. So I go around uh, to conferences, talking to people, reading lots of documents. And what I discovered is that the people who are trained scientifically are trained to think in one direction only. Like the people who deal with geology, they know nothing about hydrology, which is how water or hydrogeology. They are two complete different sections in the university. So the people who deal with geology, they have to take another course in hydrogeology, which is about how water behaves under the surface of Earth. And they have to spend four more years <laughs> to understand that. And they say, well, I'm specialized in geology. This guy is specialized in hydrogeology, although both of them are studying the Earth. You know? Or people say, well, I'm expert in this. I don't know anything about that. I met in one conference in Egypt, uh, of all other places, a, a, a Russian scientist. He was talking about the climate, of, the climate change. He was a Russian scientist from the Russian uh, Science Academy, so-called scientist, uh, but he was working for the UN Climate Com uh, Commission, which is very politically correct. He has to say all the correct things. And he made a very terrible presentation how temperatures have been rising in Central Asian cities where they have measured the temperature. Uh, not mentioning that these cities, there was a drought in the past few years. And, uh, you know, the, the, the loss of vegetation naturally led to the rising temperatures. It was not like this, an, a normal situation where you, you, you you, you measure terms. Anyway, uh, you know, I, I asked some of these questions in the discussion period, and I said, by the way, we, you know, when you talk about climate, you cannot just talk about the last 10 years. You should talk at least about a few hundred years, because you might have cycles of shifts in temperatures, droughts, you know, wet periods, warm periods. So how can you, you know, talk about that you have proof that the climate is changing based on 10 years measurement of 
temperatures in uh, increasingly dry, drying up regions. Uh, and then I asked him a question of, of Vladimir Vernatsky, uh, who was a, you know, he was a real genius, uh, but he was a person with this uh, classical idea of, you know, science where he had to deal with many fields of knowledge and science simultaneously, not specialized in one. He was a, a, a bio, uh, biogeochemist, so he had many different disciplines uh, working on them at the same time to get a total picture of things. So what he tells me, he says, uh, he said, well, first, Vernatsky is not a scientist, he's a philosopher. And in science, you know, we don't take these philosophers seriously. Yeah? And then the other thing he said, uh, which was revealing, he said, you know, I, I really don't, uh, you know, I just took some examples. I work on, in the hydrology section, but I have other colleagues in another, another floor of the building. They work on, <laughs> on these climate, you know, uh, long periods of glaciation and so on. I don't work on that. It's a completely different group. They are in another part of the building. So, it, you know, science can be corrupted because you train people like you train dogs to perform a trick. You are a clever engineer. You do your job well, you go home, you get your salary, you pay for your nice house and car and dog. In Sweden, it's called VVV. Volvo, Villa, Vuv. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have a car, a villa, and a dog. Yeah. And That's you, right. you go to your job in the morning, you perform a very nice engineering job, even if it's very sophisticated but he have no idea what's happening in space science or if really climate change is true or not. That's not, none of your business. And you don't really know what your neighbor in the factory is doing because he has a completely different education. So in that way, these people are also controlled to perform a function which is di dictated to them by the economic powers. Well, when the economic powers don't want to produce cars anymore, this guy becomes uh, unemployed or he has to go get training and another dog trick yeah. where he, that's what they tell people because many jobs are disappearing. You have to train yourself to take another job, completely different field, but you've got to get the training uh, to do that job. So I, this is a problem I have confronted with a lot of people, like this idea of transferring water from the Congo to the Chad Lake. 99% of the water experts in the world, they are trained to say no to transfer water from one river system to another river system. It's like from God, they say, they say, no, this is a terrible idea. Very respected experts on water say, no, 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 you cannot transfer water from one river system to the other system. Well, they say that there's, because you have the biological structures, you know, the organic structures in one river, the living creatures are completely different from the other river system, and these will become predatory, they will kill the poor fish or the frogs and the other river system. You know, that's the explanation. I say, therefore, it's completely uh, forbidden for water experts to even talk about water transfer in the Western world. It's not acceptable in academic circles to say, I think transferring water from this river to that river system is useful or necessary. You might get fired. You will not get your PhD. Get your Volvo. <laughs> so that, that's the kind of you know, cultural warfare. This is how you control a population and use them as much as you need and then dispose of them. Is that not also why we do need, need this thing called philosophy? Because it's on a higher level simply that, mm -hmm. that, can, that can put all these experts and, and, and academic people and, and so on um, into a framework of what is it you are all doing. Mm -hmm. Do you know there's something called animal planet as opposed to something called human planet? Mm -hmm. As opposed to the planet for the dinosaurs for so and so many millions of years ago, that things change and they're supposed to change and things are not okay mm -hmm. for human beings. That's the philosophy that you have to fit into to work with. 
And that's also what's so special about LaRouche's uh, LaRouche's as a universal genius because he has an idea of universal principles that span all these particular fields mm -hmm. of knowledge based on the idea of human creativity. That if, if you if you have the idea of human creativity, it's the same creative spark that you have in the sciences, in the arts, in, in, uh, in economy, in philosophy, all these things, which is what, what makes his, his thought so, so special. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think we, we are done. Have, uh, it's time for Hussein to rest a little. <laughs> no, it's okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Wait, wait. We have special message for <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're going to have our next regular meeting next. Thursday, not this week Thursday, next Thursday, uh, February 15th at our office. And also, we have uh, a new class series that is being run by the scientific uh, group of LaRouche PAC, the LaRouche Political Action Committee. They have finished an 11-part series about LaRouche's science of physical economy, which is available on the LaRouchePack.com homepage, and they're going to start a new series about what is uh, the new paradigm, which is going to start on uh, Saturday, the 10th of February, in the evening, with Helga Tsepp LaRouche giving the first speech, and then it will be uh, going on every Saturday. There's homework. So every second Saturday. Yeah, but there's homework. There's too. every. Every Saturday, one Saturday there's a presentation, and the next Saturday there's a discussion. The first one will be on regular Danish time, uh, 6 o'clock in the evening, Danish time, clock in Eden. The other ones are going to be too late because they're going to be Saturday evening, East Coast time, but people can follow it afterwards. Well, so. it, it depends. Some people like to be philosophical late at night. Right, <laughs> but it the would be a lot more useful to join in the discussion in the Belarus economics class than sitting playing video games or something. Right, and you can register and and get the uh, the material and homework and things like that. Yeah, so it, it, there, it implies homework. You have to read. You know, you just don't listen passively. People will tell you what the truth is. You'll have to do a lot of work yourself. Don't take anything for granted. So thanks again for coming, it's very wonderful.